Good afternoon, Danny and Nico. It's so nice to see you both today. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go into all the good stuff, um, I'm thinking about how it's such a cool privilege to be speaking with you and you're on the other side of the world, right in Budapest right now. And I um, want to ask what your favorite thing is about this time of year where you live. Uh, well, it's very hot, very sunny, and very little rain. Um, growing up in Michigan, it's just rain all spring and all April, most of May, and it only starts to get nice around the beginning of June. So after living here for so long, yeah, like the, the heat and just like this blistering sun is is a nice change i know you hate it <laughs> yeah so i was gonna say like nicole just listed all the things that i hate yeah. about this time of year because i like the rain and the cold and snow and stuff like that so i guess my favorite thing is probably that um um i do prefer like the winter and the fall but the sun comes up earlier so it feels like you have more time in the day i guess yeah so I, I dig that um but other than that <laughs> not a lot to be honest <laughs> other than that team winter but I love the favorite things that you both mentioned I am um, I hate when the trees have no leaves on them like to me it's just such a sad time of year and so now all of the trees I can see from my windows are like full bloom it makes me feel like I'm in a tree house and so I uh, personally I'm team Nico with this one I love <laughs> I love the summertime maybe it's a U.S. thing too I don't know but yeah, um, sure. I'm so happy that on this summer-ish day we all get to be together so for anyone who doesn't know you all this is Daniel Labrose, visual artist and Nicole Anderson, art history student, and so much more for both of you. Um, and I'm excited to learn more today about each of you and about how you work together and how you found each other. And um, Instagram led me to both of you and your work. And I think Instagram had a role in you both coming together. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that we like to do to get started is go through people's like personal backgrounds, kind of the journey to this point, staying in that like chronological sort of mindset. What I was thinking is maybe Danny, you can share, you know, your background pre up to meeting Nico. Nico, you share your background up to meeting Danny, and then we'll go from there on like the joint trajectory. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so I guess, um, I mean, <clears throat> where do I start? I mean, I guess I first got interested in making art um, when I was a kid. Like I have some of my first memories are of making art. And it kind of began because my mom used to work at uh, both an ad agency, but also an animation studio. And um, she didn't do any animation herself, but I believe she did translation. She was an um, art director. No. So like she directed- At the anime, at the, at the yeah. ad agency, I think she did art, art direction, but yeah. I know for sure that um, uh, she did a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. 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 My line is that like they would they would bring home um, they, they would like make um, um, like the in between animations for American cartoons and also some British cartoons, but stuff like um, Rugrats and The Simpsons and um, uh, Real Monsters, like a lot of Nickelodeon stuff they would do. Um, and she would always bring back like the tapes that like of the, of the new shows they had done. And um, whenever she would bring them home, I remember that I would just start like copying the characters from it. Um, and then later on, uh, she always tried to bring me to, be to museums, but I never really cared about museums too much um, until I think it was 2008 or 2009 when um, like I saw three really big exhibitions that like I had a huge impact, like they all had a huge impact on me. Um, one of them was uh, Keith Haring here in Budapest um, at the Ludwig Museum. And then the other ones were um, a Tim Burton retrospective at MoMA in New York. And the last one was this, it wasn't really an exhibition, it was more like a mural, like a graffiti mural that a graffiti artist named Blue did um, on the side of the Tate Modern in London. Um, so like those three kind of, like they, they all had such a big impact on me and they sort of made me take art seriously as more than just, you know, because every kid draws, but like for me, that was like the big thing that made me think like, oh, this is something that people do as like a job. Um, 
so that's kind of when I started taking it like more seriously and thinking about, you know, like how I could build a career from it and what steps one would take to build a career from it. And then I believe in 2012 or 2013, I started posting my stuff to social media um, Mm -hmm. on Facebook at the time. And then later on on Instagram too, um, because that was back when Facebook was still, you know, people still used it. And, um, (laughs) um, (laughs) <laughs> and it wasn't just like um well you know i know yeah, <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> get into my, my opinion on facebook the, the judgment road. <laughs> yeah no, that's that's a whole whole other can of worms but i just started like sharing my stuff on social media and um and you were um, like you were like 13 or yeah it was like 2012 so it was 13 yeah. Yeah. 13 14 ish and um i started building this little following on there um, and then eventually in 2014, it was through my um, Instagram page that I had met Nicole. Yeah, um, like the very, very end of 2014. Yeah, end of 2014. Um, so I guess you could go into your yeah. history now. <laughs> Before we do, there's a few things I want to like tap into in your story. Um, so mm-hmm. Danny, you talked about first, like, you know, the um, the cartoons that your mom was like in the world of that she would bring home and that you would draw then were you drawing mm-hmm. them kind of like I don't know like verbatim like in their action they were in do you know the shows yourself like were you making up what they were doing what was that experience of copying them like and how did you transition from copying them to making your own worlds I, I guess I didn't really I didn't really copy them well because <laughs> like when I look back at them I know what they're supposed to be because I have like vague memories of like, oh, that's supposed to be like, there's like that dude in All Real Monsters who's like carrying his eyeball eyeballs around. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's supposed to be that guy. But I think if another person were to look at it, they would never like recognize it. Um, but as time went on, I, I kind of started, instead of copying them, I was like, okay, so that's how eyeballs were drawn in Rugrats so that's how I'm gonna draw eyeballs now or like that's how um I don't know they drew hands in whatever show so that's how I'm gonna like the Simpsons um the hands are like a whole other story for me because like when I was in kindergarten um I would always draw characters with like either four fingers like they do on most cartoons like the Simpsons and stuff or I would draw them with like 10 fingers on one hand like just anything but five and then um one day this one kindergarten teacher came up to me it was like real like really really mean to like all the kids and she told me that I couldn't draw because I wasn't drawing like the characters with five fingers like they're supposed to be um and I remember my mom got really salty about it and she you know was like encouraging me and she was like no you can just draw hands however you want them like don't listen to her she's an idiot and stuff like that and then (laughs) <laughs> since then I haven't like I it's, that that was like for some reason that was such a formative event <laughs> for me that since then I've always drawn characters with either like four fingers or, or more but like anything but five yeah. so it was kind of like a bunch of little events like that happened and I just took bits and pieces um of the styles of different cartoons and I kind of just built my visual style out of that um, I think you were always more drawn to the surreal aspect of of any art because mm-hmm. like before sorry but like I know these stories so well that, like I can <laughs> but like um because I remember in the past you told me that as a kid you weren't that interested in renaissance or you know Rembrandt or Da Vinci no. like you you could see that that was amazing and that that was good and like you know masterly but it it didn't like spark anything in you for some reason yeah but um and your mom just kept trying and like was seeing like what would stick she was trying really hard but yeah you like you you gravitated like the I think the oldest that you hooked on to is probably Dali like this yeah pretty much yeah like the the content well, Bosch. Bosch yeah, was Bosch, a, but Bosch yeah. like came in later yeah where it's like that that technique you you didn't really get attached to their technique but it was more of the content that you admired so it's yeah. like anything that was just kooky was <laughs> Danny's thing as a child and I remember one one thing actually from like a, an exhibition of more 
classical art was. I don't even remember what the exhibition was. It was some kind of, I believe it was Renaissance, but I don't remember what it was exactly. And it was at the Fine Arts Museum in Budapest. And I remember we were walking through it and my mom was like begging me to like, just come on, just stop in front of one painting and think <laughs> about what you're looking at. And I was just like, no, I don't care. And we just like plowed through the whole <laughs> exhibition. But then at the end, there was a painting of this one martyr and I can't tell you who it was because I, I, I have no- Oh, was it the one it. with his skin peeled off? Uh, no, maybe that was a part of it, but no, I remember- <laughs> 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 but you're it's yeah it's in like the same a, it's, direction it, yeah like, it's a it's a it's a christian or catholic martyr where they're being tortured or something it, it was something yeah but like i i remember distinctly that the painting showed them with like this really stern expression on their face looking at the viewer and there's like a knife just like sticking out from the top of their head with like blood running down their forehead and that was the only one that I stopped in front of. And I was like, that is so cool. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And she, I remember her, I remember she was really salty, but I was, that was the only yeah. thing that I cared about. <laughs> yeah. You experience. mentioned that your mom was an art director at a point, maybe. Is that why she wanted you to have these deep connections with art or has art always been part of your family? Um, well, I think, I think she just kind of saw that it was something that I was gravitating towards. And whenever I gravitated towards something, she always really wanted to encourage it. So, um, you know, she would, um, for, for a while, I made like these little clay short films, like these little clay, like stop motion films. And I remember that she, um, when I started doing it, she bought me like a better camera. Like it was like a little tiny little digital camera and she bought me a better one. And she um, got some sort of editing software for me. Um, so she always just supported like any sort of artistic endeavor that I had. And I think she was just trying to sort of expand my palette, if you will, yeah. <laughs> um, with those. That's beautiful. And um, you mentioned, you know, those three exhibits or like murals or whatever they were being mm -hmm. so impactful for you, right? For people who maybe are, are less familiar with um, the Renaissance world or the work you were seeing before that, and like what it means to have seen Tim Burton, Keith Haring, you know, the Tate in London. Can you speak more to like what that contrast was like and why that made such a difference? What, how that work was different from what you were seeing maybe in the rest of your life? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, th those artists kind of, um, I think they, um, especially Keith Haring, he, he even when he was alive, he did like a lot of stuff with children um, and his style is really, um, I don't want to say childlike, but it's definitely, it's, it's super vibrant and uses like bold colors, like sort of blocks of colors. There isn't really any gradient or anything like that. There isn't really shadows in his stuff. He kind of um, painted in a way that is very um, intuitive and like primal for people, I think. So the way that a kid would pick up a pencil or a crayon or whatever and just draw lines and just color them in, that's sort of how he did it, I think. So he sort of oversimplified painting to such a degree that I think when a kid looked at it, or if a kid looks at it, um, they sort of think, and this is not to like demean his stuff. I, I'm not trying to say that it's like super, like it's like, I don't know, like so easy that a kid could do it, but like a kid looks at it and they think like, oh, I could do that too. because It's just shapes and colors and stuff like that. Um, and that's what I thought when I looked at his work. Um, I was like, okay, well, if this guy can do it, then so can I, but like, it wasn't in a way where it's like, oh, like the, the, a lot of people say this sort of thing where, and I get this critique a lot too, where it's like, oh, my five-year-old could have drawn that or whatever. But I mean that in like the best way possible when it comes to Keith Haring's work. Um, and the same thing with, with Blue as well. I mean, he, he, um, his work is really detailed. Like he has these big, bold compositions, but they're super detailed and like super like finely structured um and his with, compositions as well yeah there. right like he'll draw like a big figure but then inside the big figure there will be I remember the mural had like these these holes on this person like there were these big windows and you could see inside him and you could see like all these different people like going around doing stuff like inside the guy's body and with that like for some reason I have like another like long diatribe that I could go on with my obsession with like people and cities and stuff like that and 
we'll probably get into that later, I guess. But um, <laughs> with, with that, like, um, mural, I remember that it reminded me of, um, there was this one book series um, called uh, um, Richard, Richard Scary. yeah, Richard Scary's Busy, Busy World. Um, but also like, where's Waldo? Um, so anything that's like super detailed and like super like, like you can just get lost in it and kind of come up with different stories for the characters and just like browse these scenes for hours. Um, that's oh, what also, I really um, dug about I his. Spy. I Spy as well, yeah. yeah. I spy. That's like another like kids book that I was mm. super into. I'm yeah. still still into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that was that was what drew me to him. And with Tim Burton, it's just I I, I like some of the first movies that I saw were Tim Burton movies, like his um, especially like Batman, the first two Batman mm. movies that he did. Yeah, from I got the, the, uh, <laughs> super fan status. <laughs> yeah, also Keith Haring. I, I have yeah. him there. Yeah. So um yeah, with him, I was just I was just obsessed with him since I was like super little, like with Corpse Bride and like Nightmare Before Christmas and stuff like that. So um with that, I think since it was a retrospective show and you could see like his journey from being just like a kid in Burbank and kind of being an outcast and not really fitting in with any social clique to then working at Disney and then like getting to make all these films. Cause that is sort of my end goal at the end of the day is I eventually want to transition, not transition cause I don't want to leave painting behind but I do want to create like films and like animation eventually. Well, animation I'm already doing but like with, like I want to do like features one day. And it was just like really inspiring to see him go from, you know from A to B, I guess. So to see the progress that he went through. Um, yeah, and his visual style, I also took a lot of cues from like with his like stripes and the big eyes and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. I really appreciate that context. It helps me to understand you even your own story in this world of like creativity so much better. Um, and Nico, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about your background. Let's go there. Yeah, so um, some of my earliest memories are also of drawing and painting, and uh, I have an older sister, and she's also very uh, artistically inclined, and I remember very clearly my parents kind of on repeat just going, I don't know where you guys get this from. I don't know, because <laughs> they, they had like no artistic connection at all, my parents, and uh, because of kindergarten or even like outside of kindergarten like you remember well, like I grew up in America I'm pretty sure they had similar um like commercials here where there would be like these uh art sets for kids yeah and they would play sure, them right they, especially on Nickelodeon like the the gap commercials yeah, on yeah. Nickelodeon and it would be like all these like light brights and like all these different types of creations. Light sets brights were and, sick. And you could get like this whole set of things. And, and we would like scream and like beg for it. And like, and then, you know, birthday, Christmas, we would get it. And um, yeah, like I was, we were just obsessed. And like my parents, it got to the point where my parents were so frustrated because they felt like they couldn't keep up with our art supplies because we would just burn through them so fast yeah. <laughs> and yeah like we were just obsessed with it just naturally and our elementary school had an amazing art teacher like just she was so relaxed very hippie very free-flowing and she had a huge interest in modern art and we had all these um especially the American ones, because, you know, it's an American school. So Andy Warhol was like her favorite. Um, and then also Georgia O'Keeffe. And there is these huge posters on the wall of their art. And uh, she would be like, OK, you see that poster? Try and draw that. And then we would try and draw it. And um, or if we didn't feel like drawing it and a kid said, oh, can I sculpt it? Then she would let them sculpt it. Like, we literally were just able That's to so do cool. what we wanted. And awesome. uh, yeah, she was just really great. And um, it was a very stress-free zone. And um, yeah, I something that you didn't mention, but that I'll mention is that I had um, a lot of issues expressing myself as a child. Mm -hmm. um, I really struggled making friends or communicating at all. And in art class, that's when I felt safe enough to 
like talk to the kid next to me or in front of me and like make connections. So it, from a super early age, I just had this intuition is that art can tell us things that we can't use our words with. And that that's the whole point of it. And then um, as I got older, I became completely obsessed with history. It's like one of the five things I'm good at. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, and it turns out I'm, I'm really good at it and I really like it. So um, I just started realizing this pattern of that, um, no matter how much you want, like the scientific clear cut history, there's always going to have to be art involved in that history at some point, even if you're talking about the history of economics, you know, there, there's going to be art history involved in that whole narrative. So, um, yeah, I knew by high school that I wanted to do something with art. And I was applying to some colleges in the States um, to try to get a scholarship. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was just, I just knew something art and just see like what happens. And, um, and and also something to do with history, but there was no clear path, even though I had a lot of support, um, things were still very confusing at that time for me from childhood to high school. I didn't really know um, exactly what I wanted out of art. Um, I'm pretty good at painting and drawing, but I don't have that drive in me to like want to be an artist like it's it's um just something that I enjoy doing and um but I don't have that level of imagination I don't have that world building like I can paint a tree pretty good but like it doesn't it doesn't have the same satisfaction to me as like writing an art history paper does um and yeah and so on Instagram, <laughs> uh, we met on Instagram when we were 17 and the end of 2014, like, I think literally it was December. It was December, yeah. And actually, and, Nico, before we go there, I don't want to miss yeah, Oh, sorry. <laughs> on you too. No, you're perfect. And I so appreciate you. Like, you're just both doing a wonderful job of giving the full picture, but also getting it done like today, like your pros. Um, but anyway, so I think your story is so beautiful that this art became this different valid means of like communicating with the world. And, you know, um, from like a social work and like behavioral health background, like you put people in front of something that um, they're able to master and it changes just their whole way of showing up to the universe and what's in front of them. And so I think that's really cool that your art teacher was able to make that connection for you. I'm curious mm -hmm. if art as even like um, a pastime and not your main practice um, has your like, things that you like to paint or reflect on? Has that evolved over time? And then do you um, oh, yeah. have different like artistic practices? Like you mentioned painting growing up. Do you, is painting still your main jam or are there other things that you like to do or make? Yeah, um, when, like I said, when, your stuff over. Um, what's up? Oh no, that's just crochet stuff. That's not. But it's art. Well. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I saw that um, on Instagram too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, like I said, um, my teacher was super into American modern art. Uh, and so it was kind of confusing to me and that I thought that was the epitome, like that was our Greek, you know, history is that as a small child, we were introduced to Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, Georgia O'Keeffe, like super early on. And we were told these people are the best. And they're American. <laughs> and, like, and so that was, you know, you can't erase that from your, your mind. And as I got older, I became really interested in the Renaissance, really interested in medieval artwork, because it was more of a mystery to me, because that's not what they started us off on. And I want to say we were in the fifth grade when we finally got to Renaissance. And uh, they didn't try to make us recreate any of it, but um, we had to try to do more like life drawings, like still lives. And I remember we had to try to draw what, like our shoe, like our favorite shoe and try to get it as close as possible to, to what the shoe, you know, like- We had like, that too, yeah, we had like the shoe realism. thing. 
and um <laughs> but nobody really liked that class because you started off with all this freedom and art can be whatever it wants to be and then your last year of elementary school it's this but it was it was very curious for me of oh so you know what is art supposed to be is it supposed to be entertainment is it supposed to be spiritual is it supposed to be trying to imitate things like I had all these questions so it definitely evolved and then I got into theater and I did um not just acting but also the technical crew and so I saw both sides of that coin and of how that's also you know imitating life and and try or maximizing life or things like this especially musicals and yeah I just kept having more and more questions and now those questions are being um satisfied <laughs> with college of <laughs> of um you have an answer okay like let's write an eight page um response to this <laughs> question and um yeah so it it evolved and now I'm still super into the medieval art because there's so little we know about it, uh, which fascinates me. Um, and I just torture myself. And the more that there might not be an answer to a question, the more that I want to figure it out. So <laughs> I think that's why I like the same with um, with uh, prehistory artworks. I'm also very fascinated by and um, yeah, so, but I have a huge soft spot for, you know, 19th century European art as well. So, yeah, it definitely evolved a lot from my early childhood of Keith Haring and Warhol and Basquiat and uh, all those guys. But um, so, yeah, I guess it's matured in a way, but that I feel like that's not the right word because there's obviously maturity in Herring and Warhol as sure. well, just because it's um, children can understand it faster than they could a Caravaggio, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. And such a gift to when presented with a question, want to write eight pages to figure out the answer. I don't think everyone <laughs> that excitement, that zeal, <laughs> getting it out on paper, but we need that. And so that's super cool. Um, I remember when we were chatting the other day, I even like got to learn things through your lens of art history. You taught me about the um the star of David being yellow at that time, yeah. of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. because of all of these different things and history and, yeah. and colors. And I wondered if there's any like art history fun facts that are standing out to you right now. Something that recently, yeah, your yeah. Um, <laughs> I love those things for like. A so one time. of my favorites is Memento Mori, uh, which um, she's not gonna stop now. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Memento Mori is um, to remember death, and it became popularized um, in the 17th or 16th, 16th, 17th century. And although you could argue that even the Renaissance with all the Jesus, the Jesus paintings, that it was happening even then. But um, so like around me, like there's this dead little flower here. Yes. And yes. um the other ones have question marks on top of it and through an art history perspective which i can't shake off ever is that this is a memento mori painting to to me um and i think most art historians would immediately grab on to that is because especially dutch renaissance when they did memento mori they always did a still life and it had usually like a vase one vase had full flowers the there's another boss that has dying flowers there's a butterfly you know stop like you know motion um and like a click of the camera is that the butterfly is there in the painting but we know that if you're looking at that scene in real life the butterfly would be there one second and then it would be gone so it's like life is fleeting um you can't count on anything like um life will take things right up from under you and um to live in the moment and it was also called vanitas so you could call it memento mori or vanitas and it also shows um the main difficulty with art history especially when you're going that far back mm -hmm. is um language because vanity to us means to be full of oneself right. like narcissism but vanity back then meant um 
the fleeting life, so death. Um, so someone who possessed vanitas was actually um, like very wise because they knew that, oh, I'm only beautiful for now because I'm young or whatever, or I'm only, oh, this is only a good moment now because there's no war or something like that. Um, but they have this wisdom of that it's not going to last forever. So they weren't, um, you know, so yeah, so the language changes and you can't, uh, that's the tricky part about art history is that, um, especially when reading manuscripts is that you think, oh, I know this word in English, but today it means something totally different for us. So that's so yeah. cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. Now I have to go find a Dutch Renaissance painting and like bring my mom and be like, Nico taught me <laughs> no, 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 look for the vases, look for the flowers. Like that's so cool. So thank you. Yeah. So yeah. back to December, 2014. Now you're both in your <laughs> world on Instagram. What's happening? <laughs> Yeah, um, I just happened to find him on Instagram because <laughs> at the time we were both very punk, like super punk. At the time, I think we're, we're and, still are, are we not? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you wouldn't guess just by <laughs> looking at us anymore. At the time, we were like stereotypically punk because we were 17. Yeah, but, yeah sure. Um, I had blue hair for a little bit. I had blue hair for a little No, at the time, not neither of met. us had blue no, hair. No, not, not when we this met. This was yeah. before. And um yeah so one of my friends in high school at the time she had this Instagram and she followed a lot of art pages I think through Tumblr because you had a Tumblr, had Tumblr for a while. at the time yeah and um god I wish I didn't which was a great place for like punk art and stuff so and I was getting into zines and getting into all that stuff um like the lowbrow street art I guess yeah and I, at the time, I think it was like half a year before we had met where the Jesuit Charlie um, killings happened in France and everybody was- The um, magazine. Yeah. yeah, everyone was doing like these pencils in the, in the air, like holding up a pencil. And Danny did a take on that where it was a self-portrait, but since he doesn't really like to use graphite, he only likes to use pens most of the time. Um, he had a pen, but it was like stabbed in his eye. And I immediately understood the reference that it was supposed to be a Jesse Charlie thing, but he did it his own way. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, <laughs> that's really cool. And he was selling stickers of that image and I wanted them. And she messaged me yeah. and she was like, oh, can I buy some of those like stickers that you have? And then I checked out her page and she, um, I don't remember what song it was anymore, but she did a, like an ac acoustic cover of a song that I really dug at the time. And I think it was either like the Misfits or Joy Division or something. And I was like, oh, she's so cute. <laughs> I'm going to send her some stickers for free. Yeah. And then I did. Mm -hmm. And then like a month later, we, yeah. were, we were dating. We started like an online relationship yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. And well, it was, it was really cute because we met on Instagram <laughs> And we like would talk all day, all night on Instagram, but we started this um, like mailbox relationship, which to us was like, oh, we're so like romantic and old school because we're doing things through a mailbox and it would take a long time. And so like you sent me the stickers, but then you surprised me with a bunch of other trinkets and like a shirt. Some other stuff, a shirt and, and like, some other stuff in there too. So, then I sent you some stuff and we were yeah. just doing this back and back forth. Back and forth. And you um, sent me like bottle caps of local breweries. Yeah, just like random, like cute little stuff. And I was drinking a lot of beer at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you were living in Scotland. So, but um, <laughs> yeah, and he was living in Scotland. I was living, well, I was my last year of school. So I was a senior in high school. And we, had an online relationship for 10 months and then we met each other in person for the first time in October of 2015 where me my mom my sister and my dad all went to <laughs> Chicago here to pick him up and but like it was so it's so funny because it's like every single day all day all night you would be on Skype with me 
And so my family just got really used to you and they also fell in love with you. And it was the same with yeah. me with your parents in Scotland. Is it always seemed like this weird thing. Like, it was like we were in the apartment the with each other yeah. <laughs> because of Skype. Exactly. And Pre-COVID, was... pre yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's no. so beautiful. I think that the first motion picture you make has to maybe be this love story because Aww. it's huge. Might it's well. so yeah. sweet, right? Might as well. Just another level yeah. All. the script's already there basically yeah so. basically yeah, yeah. there yeah. And so uh, and that's so cool that you're able to bring your families into it because you were like teenagers right like we take for yeah. granted how involved our families are in our lives at that time possibly um yeah. so you had this first meeting at o'hare is that where you first met in real mm -hmm. life and then how do we get from there to you now living in budapest <laughs> Oh, uh, well, we we were traveling a lot together. So we're going back and forth. A yeah. Lot. So you stayed with us for a month and then I stayed with you in Scotland for a month. A month yeah. And then the following year, um, you came back to us. Yeah. Like for 20, the holidays, like the winter holidays. Heavier because I was sad eating. Yeah. A lot <laughs> and then that. the following summer, <laughs> I came here to visit your family here mm -hmm. and I stayed for three months and that yeah. really sealed the deal and that we we're together yeah because like, we were apartment. we were exhausted of traveling to have to see each other um and like because I already loved your mom and your stepdad but I also fell in love with the rest of your family here so that was just the sealed deal of okay I'm just gonna move here yeah and then we also found um McDaniel the college for you so yeah. that was mm -hmm. the other thing that kind of because you know you really wanted to go to college and yeah it was you know like it was just so convenient there really happened to be an american college here yeah and like an five degree. times as cheap as the <laughs> yeah right. yeah because it's um our tuition is insane for american listeners it's like what four thousand dollars a semester something like that yeah, yeah. four thousand euros yeah I, I four thousand euros yeah. yeah and um yeah so wanting to have that level of education in the states would have been impossible for my family and so it was you know this perfect degree for me perfect price perfect city yeah. um and yeah so and I was we were 19 when I moved here right? were we yeah we yeah were. 19 yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So cool. And now you're in the same city and we're in the same <laughs> Zoom today, but you're both on the yeah. same side of it. That's full circle. Um, so special. And thank you for sharing that background with me. So now we're like Zoomed up to present day. Um, yeah. And Nico and Danny, you both have like different cool things going on. Maybe Danny, we talk a little bit about your style of your work right now and how it's kind of um, just your approach and how you're bringing attention to people's unique attributes and oddities and all those fun things. Sure, yeah, we can talk about that. I mean, um, with um, with me, my creative process is very sporadic. So there will be, I don't know, like a solid month where I can't really think of anything new. And then there's like a day when I think of like 20 different things, all of which end up like panning out. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's very random when I get ideas. And um, because of that, I have like these little um, sketchbooks that I carry like everywhere with oh, me. I'll go grab um, them there. Oh, oh yeah, these ones are empty, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it's, I'm like obsessed with these really tiny little sketchbooks because they fit like just right in most of my pockets. They're moleskins. Yeah, they're moleskins. Yeah, and these are, oh, I don't know, so these are, yeah they're cool um it's um they're these ones i think are 2020 and 2021 um but there's a bunch more like before these ones yeah they're hidden in the um, drawers. yeah they're they're everywhere but i just kind of i carry these with me everywhere i go like when i'm walking around the city or um you know just running errands and whenever i get an idea i'll just, just quickly like scribble it down in one of them so i don't know I guess I can just open these are one these of them. are his children. He's lost two of them, and yeah. he has nightmares about the lost ones. I had like a full on like meltdown when I lost the last one because like the last one had some amazing stuff in it. Like I don't, 
like to like <laughs> toot my own horn like that but <laughs> it had some really cool stuff in it that I was really excited to paint and I was in Vienna and I was coming back home and I remember I drew so many different cool things in Vienna and then I was on the bus and I remember drawing on the bus and I remember putting it back in my bag and then I got home and I wanted to draw some more and it was just not there so I don't know where it went but yeah um uh, it's I, I usually I draw like really tiny like that so um I'll draw the ideas down um for some reason I find that it's easier for me to plan everything when it's like small um so when I when I draw something really tiny I find it easier to then like blow it up and like make it big later on um I don't know why it's like that I've just kind of found you've always like, intuitively. Done that. you've always done that before yeah. before you found the moleskin he would have these uh big sketchbooks really big yeah and it would just drive me nuts I think I think it was because it drove me nuts that you found you the moleskin. The tiny ones, yeah. <laughs> you would have these big sketchbooks <laughs> and then he would make this tiny little drawing <laughs> in a random oh spot of the page not like it and then flip to the next page and never use that yeah. the entirety rest of the page ever again so and then he would say oh no that sketchbook is finished but there was like this tiny of a drawing on each <laughs> of these big white pages and I said we can't you can't do this anymore and so <laughs> now he's using these tiny ones so he and, started yeah. doing the tiny ones yeah Oh my gosh, that's an awesome example of that teamwork though, right? It was an in yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, both the teamwork is both of our neuroses. <laughs> yeah, just kind of meeting. And... I feel like that needs to be a bumper sticker or something like team yeah. Yeah. Is the meeting of unique neuroses. That just feels that just feels right and very wise. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you've talked to about maybe I think um Nico you had noticed this that like Danny's work had gone from maybe punk signs to more neo-surrealism and also Danny you've talked about like maturing in your work maybe you can speak to what that's been like with color too and all that stuff sure yeah I mean like when I when I started out I um when I was like I said earlier like, what, like when I was up uploading my stuff to social media in like 2012 2013 um I was doing really um like sort of um, almost just like a one page little comics in a way where they didn't really, I didn't really think about the composition or, you know, the style or anything like that. It was just like, oh, this would be funny to draw. And then I would just draw it and upload it and that would be it. And I didn't really think any, any deeper than that. But I always had these sort of ambitions in the back of my mind to sort of create, um, create stories and to create worlds and to, um, explore um characters like you know do character studies um so at, at first since i was just making these funny little comics after a while i started feeling kind of unfulfilled with them and i started making sort of these um these big cityscapes um where it was just um the whole painting or not the paintings i didn't paint at the time we can get into that yeah illustrations right. um it would just be these big buildings, just like rows and rows of buildings. There was like no greenery, no anything on it. Um, it was just buildings and buildings and buildings. And like each little window is like open and each little window has like a character in it. And, you know, you can see their apartments and stuff like that. And um, I kind of started putting these little gag comics within the windows. So I found that if I string these little stories together via like these buildings then I sort of have a world going on where there's all these different people doing things and just walking around and um going about their daily lives and everybody has their own little adventure they're going on um and to me that was kind of the thing that like broke the dam open in a way um and since then I've started you know exploring different things and um creating different compositions that are nothing like what I used to make back then like I would have never done something like this with the vases in the past um this one with the dog I don't know if you can see that really well but oh, yeah. yeah it's like a three-headed dog and um yeah <laughs> that's more akin to like what I would have done back then but even then like um you wouldn't have painted it no no let alone that big yeah exactly and um yeah, like I, I used to make all those comics in black and white. Um, and it wasn't because I didn't like color. I just really 
didn't want to spend too much time with them. Like I just wanted to get them out as fast as possible. But then, you know, since I started feeling like I could do more than that, um, I started exploring colors and actually it was through Nicole's influence that I started adding a lot of color to my work. Um, and also she's the reason that I started painting because I really hated paint um, at the time before I had met her. Um, and I can't really put my finger on why I hated painting. I think a part of it is because um, with a pen and with a pencil too, but more so with a pen, you have a lot of control over what you're doing. So when you draw a line, that's it. And with paint, like you kind of, it doesn't really obey your commands <laughs> as much as ink does, I feel. Or not even ink, but like a pen, because like with ink, there's different like fountain pens are way harder than just a ballpoint pen. So I'm like talking like I would strictly do stuff with like ballpoint pens or maybe markers, markers sometimes. Um, and with like brushes and paint, I would always struggle because like it would either start to bleed too much and it would just spread and it wouldn't look like what I wanted it to be. Or if it was oil, it wouldn't spread enough. Um, it would just, you know, you would kind of just draw like what you would think would be a big stroke would end up really short and it's just I just had so much trouble like working with paint and then when I visited Nicole in America uh in um 2015 um her bedroom is just like covered like from corner to corner in these all sorts of, like intricate little murals and little motifs that she painted all over the place and um yeah, it was like there that I first like yeah. had like actual fun. Yeah, I, like, I, I brought you to the attention that um, there's actually really nice um, paint brushes. <laughs> that too, because, yeah. Because um, you would explain to me like how you you hate um, the standard paint brushes is, mm -hmm. is, is like horse hair. It's like it's very um, or like hay almost. It's like yeah, it's very coarse. it's very coarse. It's very um, it sprays open really easily. Um, it splatters as you're moving it across the canvas and and also just canvas. It's a bumpy surface and yeah, right. um, it can be pretty awkward to 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 get used to that texture. And so. Uh, what I used to do as a teenager is I would make these murals um, on my bedroom walls. And whenever I would have a friend over, I would ask them to paint something on, on the wall. And so now it was his turn. And he said, oh, no, I think I'll just use um, like a Sharpie or something. I was like, OK, for now, but we'll get you to, to paint something. <laughs> and, and you actually really enjoyed it. It was and, fun, yeah. And it was also the, um, the transition of when you're so used to one medium and your body memorizes, mm -hmm. this is how you get this to look that way. And so like you're bent over and you're drawing and you're trying to tell your brain, no, sit, like stand upright and go like this. Like you're, you're relearning this whole new kinetic thing. And, and it, that transition of, of learning how to do something physically is, is, can be awkward sometimes but right um yeah we just had a lot of fun doing it and then you you just got attached to it yeah right naturally so that's pretty much it yeah, yeah. that's wild I think that's so cool to um take that time to acknowledge the kinetic part of it I'd never thought about right when you're painting you are kind of more upright versus when you're on pen and paper on a table and um you've talked about kind of I think, um, Danny, when you went to school, like historical context wise, it was just like yeah. a little bit over a decade post communism. Right. And so sure. what it was like to learn in that environment versus this, um, I think, um, you had described it, Nico, as like a freedom aspect of let's paint like a Bob Ross yeah. sort of Zen in your yeah. <laughs> bedroom. Like, can you speak a little bit to those differences? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I had, when the cold describes her experiences at school, it sounds like just the exact like mirror opposite of what I had to go through. Um, so like the story that I said at the beginning of, of um, the five fingers and stuff in kindergarten, that's sort of emblematic of like the whole thing that I had to like endure yeah. in, in elementary Don't school do and high school. Don't do it this way, do it that way. There's only, yeah. there's only one way yeah, exactly. to do the thing. And, there's yeah. no like you, you, you don't get any, um, freedom to explore you don't get any freedom to you know 
um, really get into the material that you're using. You're just handed the material and you're shown how to use it. And that's it. Like there's no wiggle room. There's nothing to, you know, it, it kind of, um, I sort of look at it as if you're taking the most important thing away from art, which is exploring and expressing yourself. If you're sitting down a kid, I mean, sure, there's like important rules of composition and technique and stuff that you, um, you know, you can use to your advantage. It doesn't mean that you have to, but you can, um, because those techniques exist for a reason. Um, but I think when you're a little kid and you're, um, you're trying those things for the first time to make it so strict and to make it so um, like severe is really detrimental to kids' interest in art. So I don't think that's an accident that like basically every kid draws, but of those kids who draw, like very few of them end up becoming artists as like career down the line. Um, and I think that in large part has to do with the way that art is taught to kids. Um, and the way that I was taught was what I had just said, that it was like a very strict rule set that you have to follow no matter what. And it was just so weird to me, even back then, I just thought like, this is elementary school. Why are we being like forced to like be so specific about it when, you know, like looking back, that's like a time to, to play and to explore and to, you know, try all these different things that you've never even heard about before. And, um, yeah, it was just it was just really weird, and I, I had like no no fun with it whatsoever. Um, <laughs> and I remember there was one extracurricular um, like art studio that I went to for a little bit um, that was in my neighborhood, and um, the teacher there would teach me how to use like Photoshop and Adobe Flash. Um, so we would do like a little bit of animation. And we did some stuff with like clay and, you know, just like all sorts of stuff. Um, so she would both teach me like digital things and also like, like um, tactile non-digital things. And I remember that in that class, I had retained more knowledge than I had in like all my years of school, because I just thought that it was, you know, it was what it was supposed to be, you know, like you were allowed to explore and experiment and have fun. And in school, like kids weren't really allowed to do that. Um, and that, you know, that's just my experience. I'm sure there's other people in Hungary who had way different experiences, but I kind of found that like, since it was so close to, um, to communism, um, that a lot of the education system hadn't changed enough yet to catch up to like, um, how do I put it? Like um, a more modern standard. Um, and I remember, <laughs> just as like a funny like side note, we had watched a movie um, that had like a scene in it. It was an old Hungarian movie and it had a scene in it that took place in a classroom and the movie was shot during communism. And as we were watching it, I was like, holy like shit, that looks like our classroom. Can we swear, by the way? Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. It's just no, you're good. <laughs> I, I didn't even realize fully that you had so <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to like keep it like under like because you know <laughs> normally I swear a lot, but I want to be respectful. So I don't know. Just be yourself. So, <laughs> okay, cool. so you're in this movie, you're watching this movie and you're seeing your life in it. What, what? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Like I was just I was just looking at this movie and I was like, wow, this is like nothing has changed basically. No, it wasn't a, a movie of communism. It was the book. That thief. was that was later. That was oh, like it was that later. was yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but it was it was similar. Was, yeah. was, <laughs> that was another thing that yeah. just messed me up. But let's not get into that because it's also like a whole whole other can yeah. of worms. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it was just it, it, I, I just found that like it was a very strict, like closed system. And I just didn't really enjoy myself within it. And I didn't really feel like I was um, growing from it. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't just with art. It was also the same with like other subjects, yeah. um, especially with like math and science and things like that. Um, and then later on in high school, um, so like both, both in elementary school and in high school, I went to like alternative schools. So I got the better end of the education spectrum in Hungary, and I still had that experience. Um, and my high school was way better, but 
um in terms of art it yeah. wasn't it wasn't it was that it's, much better it's really surreal to me because the way that so here and and to some extent it's still kind of the truth of that there's montessori schools here but they don't follow the montessori um, yeah. steps they cherry pick what they like about yeah, montessori sure. yeah. but they don't do the full montessori experience here yeah. So and like, yeah, but like the Montessori schools here, you have to pay extra. You have to be on a waiting list. It's this whole shtick. And it's Whereas, just barely different. Yeah, but it's barely different than just a public like, school yeah. in America. It's yeah. it's really the same base level. Like they are told that they're getting extra, but it's in my perspective, it's not extra no, because not really. in my experience, that's exactly what just my regular public school was like sure right and you know the the montessori in montessori's in most other countries they're so extra like they're the all of these extra steps all of this specialization whereas um and it just really threw me for a loop in that you went to the better end of the you yeah, went to right. the it's best weird. schools it's and really it weird. still wasn't up to that standard yeah of um you know, being, it, it was be. being called a private school, but it was behaving like an American public school. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, when, when I got to high school, it was very, um, it, it, was, it was better. Like I dug my high school for the most part. But then, you know, the same sort of thing happened where I felt like I wasn't really moving forward. Um, and I don't want to like make myself sound like, oh, I'm like smarter than everybody. So like, <laughs> I'm not moving forward in high school. Therefore, I'm way too smart for high school. Like I'm not trying to say that it's just I was so dead set on having you know like art as a career that I didn't even really have second options of what I would do if it didn't work out like I just thought in my head like it'll work out and if it doesn't work out I'll just I don't know like probably do it in my free time as much as I can and I don't know like work at a bookstore or work at a movie theater or something like I didn't really have I, it was never my ambition to get um, a college degree and, you know, like get a really good paying job or anything like that, because I just I just can't picture myself in those terms. Um, and, you know, there's nothing against people who can, because like, you know, a lot of people need, um, you know, like um, a secure monthly paycheck more than anything. And as an artist, you don't really have a secure monthly paycheck, at least in the beginning, you don't. Um, and it just kind of depends like, oh, did I make a sale this month? Okay, cool. Did I make one this month? No, I didn't. Oops. So like, it's it's a much more um, loose career, I guess. But um, I just felt that I needed that. And um, I couldn't really go on in high school at that point. Like I was in a really bad mental state. So I was living it with my, um, with my um, mom and my stepdad in Edinburgh at the time in Scotland. Um, and they um, really supported me in um, dropping out of high school and leaving that situation and starting, you know, like really seriously um, on my art career. Um, and I think like a lot of that had to do with the art classes that I, I went through, because if the art classes had been better, I feel like I would have been more motivated to bear through the rest of the classes um but since they were so restrictive I just felt like I could do way more on my own um and mm -hmm. yeah but you, you had so much support not just from your parents but also from um like a lot of your first proper jobs after mm -hmm. you had dropped out was through advertising agencies um yeah sure people who had known your mom for forever or who yeah. had known you since you were a child and yeah they had seen um, like stuff on Facebook. And yeah. Stuff. And, and they saw like a promise there. Like they saw that there was a lot of potential yeah. there. And so, yeah, there, there was a lot of people in the advertising world here in Budapest and even outside of Hungary, like in the, Vienna, UK. in the UK, where they saw that something was going on with Danny and that, that, that they wanted to give him a try. And then they were really happy with the results. And so it, it really was um, very tentative steps, but um, it was just a gut feeling that yeah. everybody shared. Like 
I had the gut feeling, your parents had the gut feeling, my parents knew you on like two occasions, they had a gut feeling, it was just, it was something that, yeah, like there was no second option, it was just. Well, you guys had met me after I had dropped out, and yeah. you guys just mm -hmm. were like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I don't know it's it's hard to explain it's like obviously there was a talent there but sometimes people can have a lot of talent and you still get this sensation of that you want to tell them like oh well maybe you should go to college just in case or like but for some reason like maybe it's fate I have no idea but something was telling the world of everyone around you of like just let Danny drop out and do his thing and it'll all be fine and it's probably mostly the luck for me, think, <laughs> yeah to be honest, but yeah but that's yeah. amazing I imagine it was so frustrating to have this resolve to be an artist and then not have the institutions that were coming around you actually uplift that like goal and that dream and so it seemed like you had to kind of depart from that traditional yeah, yeah, yeah. path um I'm curious though like I think on your website you talk about um continuing to explore different mediums right and like virtual mm -hmm. reality and like all this different stuff how has your self-education like how have you been able to continue to learn and explore without these like formal structures and then also um I, I was fascinated when we talked just a little bit the other day, even about what being a professional high school dropout has meant for being in the art scene where you live. Yeah, so, um, I mean, in terms of self-education, like I, I, I've always been like, I've just been a naturally curious person like my whole life. So um, even before school, like I would always um, like obsessively just like browse through books of like animals and like dinosaurs and volcanoes and i was really obsessed with mushrooms at a certain point research yeah you're really would, good at research yeah. yeah like i would always love to just dive really deep into subjects and um i remember for a while uh, when i was really into um when i was really getting into making films um or the idea of making films i was i would always watch the movies like through to the end of the end credits and try to remember like what each person on the like the cast or not the cast but like the cast and crew list would do um so yeah i, I always just loved like diving deep into stuff and and exploring different subjects so to me it didn't feel like mm, it, it felt like when i dropped out i was learning more because there wasn't this sort of distraction in the way where i was like okay i need to learn this and i need to learn these you know rigid sets of things that are given to me i could just learn what i wanted to learn and what i found interesting um and i don't feel like i missed out on anything that i would have learned in high school because i still ended up learning those things just on my own in a more interesting and palatable way um there were very few teachers that i i got along with and i liked through high school um i had a really good english teacher um and i don't know if she still teaches I believe she moved to Sweden I don't think she's even in Hungary anymore but I had not that that's relevant to the topic but like she's she's she was a really cool teacher and I I, I um I had a lot of good experiences with her and but also my um, music history teacher um was like one of my favorite people ever and he um even introduced me um like outside of classes to um like David Lynch movies um to like Lars von Trier movies um like Agnes Varda movies like he introduced me to a lot of different things that weren't related to the subject that he was teaching um so I always gravitate to the teachers who would um sort of teach you like like go beyond what they were given to do um the ones that would just kind of you know push you in directions that they thought like there's no way he could have known that I would be into David Lynch movies but he was like you know just like threw me a bone and he was like let's see if he's into David Lynch movies and sure enough it ended up working out so I think with those teachers in mind that's kind of what I followed after leaving the education system is just that curiosity and that sense of why don't we give this a shot why don't we try this um and that's also the same thing that i do in my in my art i you know um will occasionally just be like what happens if i use i don't know enamel instead of acrylic on this painting or like what happens if i 
you know, add some shading to this one, which I normally don't really shade, but like, what if I shade this part with like a pastel or something like that? So I don't know. It's just, I just don't like being bogged down to a single thing. It's just fun to When it comes explore. to the, the tech stuff, like you taught yourself 3D animation and some software and I still, it's been years now that you've been doing it. I still have no idea how, how you figured it out because like, because whenever he has to watch a YouTube tutorial about something, there's this slew of swear words that you hear in the next room because he hates watching tutorials and he's very impatient if you like sit down to show him how to do something and he, I love it. yeah he just wants to do it and like so he'll watch half of the youtube tutorial about 3d modeling and and then he just like would figure the rest of it out himself through lots and, of like fuck ups like yeah, through through, lots yeah, of messing and, up and just not doing it right yeah but now it's like you just you just do it and um yeah you're just really digitally talented like <laughs> like i i like in the beginning before we were recording like we told you how like we got this new ipad and for him it's really <laughs> fascinating but even for me more so because i didn't have a laptop until i was like 13 14 and pen, you, like attaches with yeah and like and with so with cool. like my relationship with him i've noticed how um like definitely when i have kids one day like they will know technology very young because i see like him my other friends like they just know like immediately what to do and i'm just like a grandma i'm like what <laughs> like what what is this thing and like if what will happen if i press this button and like i'm like afraid of it to some degree but like in terms yeah. of the the ar and the vr stuff um i joined this um innovation lab with um some of my friends in 2016 in budapest um it's called kitchen kitchen budapest and um, Kibu, yeah, they were having like a talent program at the time where um, you could pitch an idea and you would get like a studio space to work on the idea for, um, I believe it was six months, but we ended up extending our stay to a whole year. Um, and we, we were just making like fun little VR projects there. Um, and also like augmented reality, like AR projects as well. And actually like with one of, one of the guys who, um, I was um I was working with at that lab. We're now like making our own like VR game that's going to be published on um I think Oculus um in yeah. uh, Oculus Quest um sometime in September. I don't know if I can talk about it <laughs> more than that, but yeah. like yeah. it's it's just like you know like one of those things where um I had no experience with VR or or AR or anything like that and still even now there's people on the project who are way more professional and know way more about the subject than what i know but still it's like if if i were to never try it i feel like i would just end up mm -hmm. beating myself up for the end of time of like oh like what if i tried that vr project like that could have been fun so even though it's like i'm learning a lot through failure and i'm learning a lot through um you know just kind of faking it till i till i, I make it <laughs> Um, I, I can't really imagine like doing it in any other way. Um, cause I'm just, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I think that's awesome. And I think that this really, you know, important differentiator for both of you is that intrinsic like motivation to keep doing the thing. I think for a lot of people like school exists so that you get through it because otherwise you just don't have the motivation. Right. And so you don't need that those um walls or those like check marks if you know how to kind of let your curiosity like lead you to actually you know show up and do stuff um and with technology too to be using it in these really helpful ways it's so exciting for the world to get to benefit from the cool stuff that you guys are doing in those spaces um i wanted to think about a little bit so like you mentioned these things like dropping out of school and like being self-taught and in like my New Yorker in me or like the US like a citizen in me is like, that's so cool. Like you're gonna be the most popular, like you're gonna have all the gallery shows. Like, and then you shared with me this really um, surprising like anecdote the other day of maybe a collector who wanted you to have a degree for their sake. Like, can you tell me yeah, about yeah. in the art scene where you are um, with your identity? 
Yeah, that was that was trippy when that happened. Yeah, it's um, really taboo here. Yeah. To drop out of high school. Yeah, it is. It is really taboo. Mm -hmm. Like they kind of. I I have a friend uh, who's also a painter, and he's super talented. Um, and he told me this one anecdote, um, where he was. I don't even remember the full context of it, but the bottom line was that he was going to school for fashion design. Um, so not even art, like not painting or anything like that. It was just yeah, like fashion textiles, design. Textiles, sewing. Yeah, textiles mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And um, for a while, he, he wouldn't talk about how, or I don't know if he would talk about it or wouldn't talk about it, but bottom line was that um, they would always ask him like where he like got his degree from. And he yeah. wasn't even graduated at the time. And he would say like, oh, like I'm in school for fashion design and immediately they would take him more seriously. Yeah. Um, and whenever they would ask me like where I went to school, it would always be like, oh, like you didn't graduate high school. You don't have a diploma. Like, OK, are you going to get one? Like, yeah. are you going to like finish yeah. it anytime soon? But like it would be after they would be purchasing a painting exactly yeah and they would the go part. on and on and on about how amazing the painting is <laughs> and how they're so excited to hang it up yeah and how like oh he's a master he's a genius like just blowing smoke up his ass and like yeah. and then the second that they would ask oh where did you graduate from like what college and he'd yeah. say i didn't even graduate high school they would like you would hear like that boom, like that, yeah. <laughs> like they would just tunnel just, vision just crickets, and, like just, and just crickets yeah and, and back, all of yeah. a sudden their their idea about you know how amazing the artwork was would would change and yeah and um and it's it's definitely a group of people here in Hungary and that um it's a subset usually of, like, usually it's like 50 and up mm -hmm. um people who aren't very well traveled and who are usually only in business or in some type of non-artistic field so it's very pigeonholed but it's a very big pigeonhole <laughs> like there's a lot of them and like I was interning at a gallery um here for a while and um I had mentioned how how weird it is that like people here are obsessed with a fine arts degree. And uh, one of the people who was working there, just because I was just like talking about it casually, and they interrupted me and they said, yes, 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 it's because it's Eastern Hungary and it's horrible. <laughs> and I was like, or so Eastern know. Europe, like, yeah, they, so like they're, they're aware, aware of, of it. it. <laughs> they're aware of it, but it's still a custom that exists. So there's yeah. no there's no tearing it down anytime soon. So it's just something like you just have to bite the bullet and just yeah. get past it. And now it used to bring us a lot of anxiety. Like whenever there would be time to make a sale or an interview or yeah. a gallery show, you know, expecting that question to pop up, it, it would It'd always you be know, like a, make like us a, really nervous. Yeah. Um, like we'd come up with yeah. different scenarios of how to explain it and like yeah. how short should we get it? Like, do I explain to them that I had like mental health issues and that's why yeah. I dropped out? Or do I just cut it short? And I'm like, well, it's worked out so far without a degree. Yeah, like, so. the, you know, and yeah, so a lot of stress about that, but putting it out there first before they ask us the question has been the easiest yeah, way. Yeah, for real. And I think also at this point, me reiterating what you just said is that in America, it's a totally different idea. And even in Western Europe, it's a totally different yeah, idea. Sure. Like in Paris and in London, it's really common for artists to, to do one semester of college and then drop out yeah. <laughs> or, or also just not complete high school. And, um, but here it's still very much, like I remember somebody told me that oh, you should learn how to do fine arts like da Vinci, even if you want to do Keith Haring type of stuff, because at least the world knows you're capable of doing da Vinci stuff. And it's just your personal choice to do the Keith Haring stuff. And yeah, was, I was, was like, I, I what? <laughs> I was just so confused about that was, like, that was how, like, just very like, like how, yeah. how do you even know? 
like it's just yeah <laughs> people get really worked up over really crazy things and I think yeah. so mm-hmm. often it comes from maybe even like personal insecurity right of like I have to have my degree so that you know that I'm confident yeah. mm-hmm. so I want yeah. you to have your degree because I blah 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 like I don't know but Oh, it's, I think it must sh- reveal so much to you both about humanity when you see these people get so out, bent out of shape over things that don't bother you in the same way. So that's just eye-opening. A very, um, but I think it's so cool too how you've chosen this um, forthcoming approach of like we don't have anything to hide. Like it's not like it kind of yeah. stigmatizes for other people and maybe is this source of like disruption in the Eastern Hungarian like space of galleries and very exciting stuff. I'll be excited to see even like 10 years from now, what that means for who's in those spaces. And if anything has changed, um, I, before we (laughs) we're getting so close to showing your actual works, I promise. But, um, before we do, I want to come back for a second to those moleskin notebooks. I remember, um, Mm -hmm. you both speaking about how those were maybe a way that you collaborate with each other. And I wanted to just hear a little bit more about what in the day-to-day it looks like for Nico to contribute to your work, Danny. Sure, yeah. Um, with the moleskins, we usually, um, like like I said, I'll walk around the city or just be here in our apartment and I'll, I'll you know, jot down whatever ideas I have. And then, um, you know, there's, like I said earlier, there's like months where I don't, or like a month or so where I don't come up with any new ideas because it's just like the wells run dry. And that's usually the time when, you know, we look back at the sketchbooks and see what's in them. And but you're usually in such a sour mood that you're having an yeah. artist block that I look back at yeah. the older because if I if, if I do it myself, I'm like, no, this sucks. This is not good. Yeah, it just this the whole horrible. world, the, the sky is falling moment. I'm an imposter. Yeah. I, I'm not an actual <laughs> good artist. I'm yeah. just I just draw and I'm horrible. Yeah. So so then and I comes in. Yeah, I, I come in and I slap him around and I'm like, <laughs> look at this. Yeah sketchbook you finished just two months ago and look at all the great material that was in it or or like sometimes he'll feel insecure about the sketchbook that he made two months ago yeah and then I'm like okay like let's look at it and then he's like oh wait no actually this is pretty good yeah. <laughs> and then I'm just like, like yeah okay it's not that yeah bad, yeah just, just the the self-critic is very strong in this <laughs> yeah. one and um yeah and then sometimes like up here we have um it's a really bizarre um <laughs> schedule the to-do list yeah this okay. is his to-do list for may so this is the month of may and i made it so and it's rainbow and yeah, we just like, um, we just, like paint it to yeah. like, picture frames because like we do have like a little bulletin board but, but it's, it's full. so full yeah. of stuff that we just tape yeah yeah we find a way but like um yeah so like sometimes like here um he needs to have like five paintings for a gallery um that was due last month and then he needs to give them another five paintings for this month yeah and you know there's like 12 different things here that he has to complete by the end of may absolutely and so there's always that sense of overwhelming stuff even though we are super grateful that we have this overflowing schedule and not like trying to you that know schedule yeah not trying to like phone up people like please give me some work to do like there's yeah. plenty of work to be done um but yeah that sense of being overwhelmed does still linger and so when this usually happens and he's like okay I have to do a digital work for these cups for a bar for example um and uh but simultaneously he needs to make compositions for paintings Mm -hmm. i'll go through his sketchbooks and i'll find compositions that i find to be painterly yeah um and less illustrative um and i put sticky notes on them and then he'll pick it up and he'll look at them and then he'll say oh I really like that one or or though there will be a sketch that is more illustrator like and then yeah. we bounce ideas off of each other like oh like that is a really great image but for an illustration but what if you added this or took that out of the composition and then that would look better right. on a canvas and be more painterly um and and it also depends on the size of the painting like 
usually he does do this type of size, but he also has a bunch of tiny ones for this other gallery that prefers tinier paintings in their space. And um, yeah, it's like, you know, it's a very different approach, but it's a systemic approach and that has worked out best for the two of us. And then sometimes we'll decide, okay, like with this one on Instagram, you there's like a time lapse and I'm doing the background mm -hmm. and off the camera, I'm mixing the colors, but it's not like he's not doing anything. He's working on chocolate box designs for a cafe, you know? So it's like, um, this has some good stuff in it. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, you're just Sorry, looking through yeah, it. I'm just looking. Yeah. And so, so it's like, um, it, it's like having an assistant basically, but it's also, um, it's, you're more than an assistant. well, no, I know. I just don't, I don't know what other word to, to use. I don't think it exists yet, but <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and it feels good for me too, because it's really difficult to, um, to like, see him not know what do I work on I only have 24 hours in a day and we actually have this Keith Haring book that was it's a children's book and it says um the title of it as I I wish I never had to sleep or something like that yeah that's, that's it. and and that's basically your life is that if you didn't have me then you would probably you know you used to have five cups of coffee a day before I came along. You said eight cups of coffee a day. And now you have like a max of like two or three. Two or three. Yeah. We kind of yeah. cut it down. Yeah. So he really wishes he never had to sleep because he just always is working on something. And uh, uh, yeah. But with me here, he actually does get to sleep because we can. We we're still here, work. right? You need to get re-energized. We will show up. Yeah. The next day. There's good. There's good wisdom in that. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so I will pull up the work so that we can actually um, see some of this awesome stuff. So I just oh. went through and chose some random different things that stood out to me. <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit about you know how these different things came to be. Was this something you had an idea for on the bus, like? just anything that comes up for you when you look back at these with the first one I think that from, from what I remember that's at an apartment um like that we rent out and we were renewing the apartment at the time and I had just gone and just took I was just taking photos of like what it looked like and yeah I don't remember what the thought was behind this one actually but the <laughs> <laughs> I actually forgot that I made that one. I didn't even remember <laughs> this piece. It's kind of cool to see. It's so um, cool. I remember, I remember when you made that one. Yeah. I think when these um pop up, it it, it kind of comes from when you have these moments where it's like, oh, I have an hour where I don't need to work on anything. And so it's it's like I kind of feel like it, it's though. sometimes you'll sketch in your sketchbook or you'll go you'll go through your gallery in you your phone, phone yeah. and you'll find something and then you'll sketch digitally yeah so some days you feel like sketching digitally because I just kind of intuitively walk around yeah. my phone and take photos of everything that I see yeah. so I'm like, I could sketch mm -hmm. on that later so yeah I think that was just that was kind of just an experiment yeah like a, a digital sketch that you liked yeah to the point where you posted it and with the second one I drew that one in Vienna uh when I was there a few weeks back um I was there because it was part of like a group show um and we um like I, I was just walking around like downtown Vienna and I was just taking photos of buildings and um, it, it kind of looks like I, I did like an old illustration of this Greek monster with like a hundred mm -hmm. heads and a hundred legs and arms and stuff. And I think I, um, I've been Hecaton wanting to- Hecaton Kyries. Yeah, I think yeah. that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, Hecaton yeah. Kyries, yeah. Um, and yeah, I was just kind of somehow like it just popped into my mind and I was like, I don't know it, it just kind of thought I thought it was like funny that it's like following this couple um we just like incidentally happened to be in the shot um yeah I think that was another one of those where I just found like a cool photo on my phone yeah oh they're so cool they make me want to live in this world where you could walk down the street and have this crazy <laughs> monster thing following you and like pay it no mind it just so physical <laughs> and so fun so thank you for explaining that okay this also was super cool to me and maybe a little bit different than some of the other stuff that I've seen yeah sure 
this was um uh we were when was this like 2016 i want to say you you were yeah. here or 2017 maybe i don't know if you had actually i know no, i it think was, it was 2017 it was definitely budapest because i know the yeah. cafe that we took this yeah. photo at i was i, don't I think i there. had been living here for like a month when maybe you, yeah and no we were, no i was visiting it was my last month of visiting here yeah because then this became a part of foot shop that was in 2018 the show, yeah the show and was i wasn't able to go there to the foot shop show right. because i yeah, had not you're moved right. here yet you're right yeah no because you already been you already moved here in 2017 and the foot shop show was 2018 no yeah no i definitely wasn't able to go to the foot shop show because you i hadn't already. moved here yet anyway um <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> maybe i was visiting my parents and i got something confused like that yeah there was i yeah. remember that you weren't at the show but um, yeah but it was for the, the foot shop show yeah, yeah. um <laughs> yeah that's what i remember and is that you we, Nico, in the photo yeah yeah, yeah that's, that's her me. yeah um we t we were at a cafe with our friend we, we were with marcy when mm -hmm. i took this photo yeah and um yeah like i i always um I love to um, draw like machinery and I love to draw like coffee machines. And Nico always seems to me like she's always racking her brain on something. <laughs> like even when she's just sitting there, her eyes just look like there's like some stuff going on. <laughs> um, and so it was just kind of visualizing that. That was my my idea, being yeah. it, especially if she has coffee, which she was having in this photo. Yeah. I remember and very well, zooming. we were we were talking with marcy mm -hmm. about um the oxford um data scandal oh yeah yeah that's the what, yeah, yeah uh, that's yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was like a day before and i didn't know that much about it and yeah. marcy was telling me all about it and i was in that yeah. photo i'm looking at him and he's explaining to me what had happened yeah right and then yeah yeah so that's yeah. wild and it all kind of like fits together i can see how the wheels are turning in your yeah <laughs> i'm like what is this what's going on in the world <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh anytime someone says the word data even i'm just like yeah, sure. <laughs> um yeah. but i love this that's so cool okay this too felt very just uh, like different from some of the other things that you do what yeah. was scary yeah, this was, um, I, I was experimenting around with like making some 3D pieces. So um, I, I, I draw flowers a lot and um, we actually are planning to make like a whole exhibition of uh -huh. just flowers sometime. Um, we're big flower people. Yeah, we're big flower people. And um, yeah, I just thought that like combining my usual, cause I do like a lot of like handwritten stuff and I do like the little action, like comic book action lines on my, on my art a lot. And I thought it would be interesting to mix like the 2D with the 3D, uh, which is also why I like to do those photo drawings is like I'm mixing like two different like mediums and it's just just fun to see those clash. Um, but yeah, with the flowers, I, I, um, I often draw them with like a petal getting picked off or like um, the flowers in my art are often very um volatile yeah they kind of they're yeah. very sassy in a way i guess <laughs> um so they complain a lot um because <laughs> that's my experience with flowers is like we we have a bunch of plants in the living room and there's one particular one and i don't know what it is but like a pea, is it a peace lily uh yeah calla not calla lily but it's some type of lily it's some kind of lily yeah it's so particular it just only <laughs> it only blooms when it feels like it like yeah you can give it the best like you can give it yeah. just the right amount of water there is the like right two whole sun. months where if i were to have watered the flower it would try to die yeah and so only danny could water it because the flower only it's like had bonded a thing. to me yeah. for some reason but even with me it just gets like it just it's so picky yeah um you have to so, like turn it and then sometimes it doesn't like being near the window yeah. that it usually likes being at and so, so. yeah so that <laughs> yeah. plant that that just it's just a total diva of a plant yeah inspires like a lot of my plant um pieces i guess so mm -hmm. yeah that's 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 the story behind that one <laughs> yeah, i think that's so valid actually flowers are very particular um they yeah. want to be treated just so and so this one is it all digital or was there like a photo shoot on the pink backdrop of like a like 
what is this? No, it's, this is all 3D render. So I, I um, render this, um, there's a 3D software called Blender. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what I do all my 3D stuff in. Um, Cause um, it's um, just pretty like it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to use, but it's easy to learn. And mm -hmm. like, once you learn it, you kind of, it's like riding a bike, like you don't really forget it. Um, and I've just kind of stuck with it um, since, yeah. since I started using it. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's all 3D. Um, it's just the 3D render. Um, so this is all digital. And um, another thing is that like, when I draw flowers, I often draw daisies. Like even on that one, it's like the white petals with like the yellow center. Um, and I'm not sure where that comes from necessarily, but I just really, I just dig daisies. So yeah. Me too. They're so cool. No, I love this. And I can't believe it's all 3D rendered. That's amazing. Um, okay. This is more like how I discovered your work, this sort of style thing. So I can't wait to hear more about what's right. going on with this. <laughs> Yeah, this is the um, this is a part of a series that I did in um, 20, 2019 through um, twenty twenty, um, where um, I drew just my favorite buildings in the city in, in Budapest, um, and this is the Gresham Palace, which is this super old um, hotel. It's also the, the Four Seasons Hotel. Yeah, Four Seasons yeah. Hotel, um, and uh, yeah, it's just this big like ornate palace that's like in the center of the city. And um, it's just like one of my favorite buildings. It's a really beautiful one. And uh, someone keeps messaging. Yeah. Us, but I muted it. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, it's just like one of my favorite buildings. And um, in this series, um, I was covering like a lot of buildings that were more, um, how do I put it? Like there was a lot of secessionist buildings in it. Mm -hmm. So things that are very different from my style. Secessionist um, is um, the... European way of saying art deco is art yeah, deco, art nouveau. Art nouveau, art deco. Well, yeah, in America it's art deco. And <laughs> there's yeah, so secessionist, but then there's like the the there's different ways that people say art nouveau around Europe. So you're saying one of the ways, just to for the sake of any confusion. I love that. <laughs> but, yeah, in America we say art deco and Europe it's art nouveau secessionist. Yeah. So continue. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, it was just I just that was like a really fun series to do because like those buildings are way different from from my style. And um I just thought, yeah, it was just like a fun thing to see them clash. And um I always love to depict cities. So it was it was like a different thing for me to depict real life buildings instead of just imaginary ones. Yeah. Um, and still have, you know, my gang of characters um, populate them, I guess I could say. Yeah. So with this series, you, it sounds like and like, correct me if I'm wrong, you start with the plan of what building you're going to highlight and then you go in and build the world of creatures. Yeah. Is that right? OK, yeah, that's that's usually I, I usually. Um, I walk around the city and I take a lot of photos and um, I uh, tend to then when I get back home, I tend to um, get on Google Earth and in Google Earth, you get that 3D view kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and in the 3D view, I'll take screenshots of the building and then start drawing it based on that. And then I start once the building's done and I have the building on its own. So I create like a full illustration of the building first. And then I start adding characters to it mm -hmm. after after the fact. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's what people really loved because um, this was really popular here. It, it was very successful. Um, it was published through this uh, Budapest or, or Hungarian um, cultural magazine called Hype and Hyper. And something that a lot of people said that they really loved about it was the unique perspective, because usually when you're looking at these buildings, you're on ground level and you're looking up and it's gorgeous whatever way you look at it but he he put it in a way and that the perspective of the artist is almost as if Danny is like floating in midair and then like tilts himself to look at the the building just so like and drone. so yeah like a drone or something and and it's a unique perspective of the building that not a, that even native Hungarians, native Budapest people <laughs> um, really. have never really looked at the yeah. building before because you're always on ground level looking up. 
and you're never you know from a if you're from afar then you're probably on the other side of the river on buddha and looking at Pesh, but even then it's so far away that you don't really see the detail. You just see that that's the Gresham Palace from the other side of the river. So um, yeah, it was very, very unique perspective. And also just like carving them out like that and having the beige backgrounds. Like Mm -hmm. there is this one that stood out from the secessionist buildings, which was called the Janos Palpapater houses, which is this uh, district that is um, not it's not poor but it's not the most looked after district um, it's like um, how would you explain it it's like well it's just it's, it's not just, like it's, it's down an and out ur- or anything no, no, no. It's, it's just it's, like an urban area yeah city yeah it's like not it's super, not it's, not, it's not as yeah it's not funded it's not as well funded it's not touristy yeah um, it's very residential yeah. And um, but there's this set of buildings that Danny was obsessed with because it being all it squashed like together, they look like a staircase. And so he did that same style with this one is that he carved it out and people kept asking him, like, this isn't Janos Palpapater. Like, it looks so amazing because that district isn't, you know, like eye candy. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. And and he was like, yeah, like it's from that district. It's like in the heart of that district. And right. um, people loved that one. And yeah, it, it was it was one. it was a series of buildings that they wouldn't have guessed somebody would have made an artwork out mm-hmm. of because and he, and he put them to the same level of that that building is just as good as the Gresham, Gresham yeah. Palace. Right. So. Oh, I love that background too. And that um, just like shedding light on a place that doesn't get the attention it deserves. It sounds like <laughs> so it's really special. And I'm wondering about these creatures. Like, do you go in? Um, are there some signature creatures that are always there? Did you know you were going to put the snake around the building? Are the creatures always different in each piece? Like, what is that all like? There's some recurring ones. I mean, the, the snake usually shows up Um pretty often in the, in the big pieces um and there's both a practical reason for it and also just like a stylistic I, I don't know how I would put it not mm-hmm. like um philosophical reason I guess I could say um because I really um I just dig snakes I just think that um I, like I had this one um thing when I was a kid where um at the Budapest Zoo you could get to, um, you, you would be able to like go into the reptile house and the reptile house, um, they would take photos of people posing with this boa constrictor and just this giant, huge snake. And um, I remember I was really scared of it. And then but I you, kind of- you held him anyway. Yeah, I overcame the fear and I took like this photo with the snake and it was just like, I was like five years old and it was just like this big experience that I had. So since then, I just always loved drawing snakes. Um, and the other reason is because if I draw a giant snake and it's like super long and like wide, then it covers up like a lot of stuff on the drawing. So it's just a nice way to fill space. It's just practical. Um, so snakes definitely like a recurring one. It's not always with the same pattern, but I'll, I'll draw snakes quite often. You also um, have a snake tattoo. Yeah, I got a, I got a tattoo of one of the snakes. Cool. Um, <laughs> and then, um, the pigeons are also recurring yeah. gang of characters. We <laughs> yeah. love we love pigeons. Or I love pigeons. I, I think like there is this um it's, it's such a good question that you asked that because um there is this one illustrator that uh, we're good friends with and she had this chorus where you make your own iconography dictionary. Mm-hmm. And it was a a great uh exercise because we realized that he has all of these little creatures that mean certain things to him so Mm -hmm. like snakes symbolize bravery um pigeons symbolize like survival survival but like also like um like it's this mix of intelligence and aloofness yeah where it's like you're add but you also are super intelligent so maybe from an outsider perspective you look like super goofy and silly but there's this you know the pigeon is actually very intelligent and very fit for survival um and that's that's, yeah that's always my logic behind pigeons is like they look like people think that like 
they're really they, stupid, but yeah, they're but amazing survivors. They survive, <laughs> so they must know yeah. something. Like they must yeah. do something right. Yeah. Because the amount that we have in the city, like most of them are alive. There's very few dead ones, so they must yeah. be doing something good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, there's those ones. Um, the dog is like another one that always mm-hmm. shows up. That little black like triangle looking dog. Um, and I don't know if it's on this one, but I have two yeah. characters. Oh wait, which one? The which was anything? Um, which one? You say. <laughs> you say. I have this little guy. That yeah, I, the number. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, number. Is that what you were? Yeah. Well, there you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have this. I don't know how to show it best, but like. No. <laughs> yeah, that little, the little, that guy. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I always, I, I draw him. Non boy. Non boy. Yeah. yeah, I came up with him when I was like sixteen, and it's just been like sticking around in my art since then. And I have that guy, and there's like this bird, bird guy that I like to draw a lot. Um, mm-hmm. who, um, just like this. Yeah, bird boy. Yeah, yellow guy with like this long like beak, with, like black eyes i don't know <laughs> oh my gosh that's so okay i'm so glad that we went there because now i can look for these special characters and what they're doing yeah, yeah sure the works that come up and what um was the means of making this piece is this all digital too or was there a painted version of like what is this yeah no, this is all digital this is this is just completely on on photoshop and um with the help of google earth um, and then we later turned them into prints. So we, we made this into a print series. And um, from what I remember, we did five of each, um, each building. Um, so and yeah. now they're cups. And now they're cups, yeah, because a company bought the rights to them. So now they're on cups in like certain like um, and- venues, yeah, yeah, all over the city. So so you know. cool to get to see your work in uh, in real life in the world doing its thing. Um, that's yeah, it's awesome. fun. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, this is our final slide here, and these are two of those like crowd kind of style, mm-hmm. right? I'd love to hear more. Yeah, um, with these ones, I, I I just really I just dig drawing like big like bustling crowds of people um, because you have a fear of crowds. I do have a fear yeah. of crowds. Yeah, I don't know if there's I I I've, I thought a lot about that. I don't know if there's a correlation because like it's like my favorite subject to paint. But it's also a subject that I just I just can't deal with in real life. So whenever I'm in crowds, I'm like like I always get like near a panic attack. Like I just don't function well. Aside from um, I I do well on airplanes and movie theaters. That's yeah. it. Those are like the two contexts where I'm okay in crowds. But like if we're at the mall or if we're at a concert or anything like that, I just can't function within a crowd. Um, so yeah i don't really like i don't draw it i i don't i don't draw them to get over my fear so there's no i don't think there's any correlation to be honest but i just like drawing them because i just like to highlight people's like uniqueness and i i I always um you know when i look at the city and i see like all these different people like from all walks of life you know just walking around doing their thing um I always like to imagine like what their stories are like you know what they're getting up to what are their errands for the day like what are their backgrounds and to me that's like what the crowds symbolize in a way um is that there's this big melting pot this big group of characters who are just walking around doing their thing um and uh yeah that's kind of it I mean like with with my approach to them I I don't really sketch them to be honest like I don't I don't make a sketch beforehand um they just yeah it's just kind of like improvised in a way where I um I just take colors and um like pick out colors that I think would mesh well together and then I um sort of make blobs in a way just like blobs of color here and there and just kind of connect yeah. them and build them they on top kind of, each of other. they kind of just like appear yeah appear it's very lovecraftian where it's like yeah like he'll he'll take like the red and he'll make a line and then he'll make like a semblance of shoulders and maybe a nose yeah and then he'll go in with black and then all of a sudden it's this totally new individual on the canvas and that's usually how he does it but just recently a few days ago i think it was uh catapulted by one of your mom's friends 
asked do you ever sketch them yeah and that's when we realized that you've never sketched a crowd yeah no. and so now you for your first time ever you've sketched a crowd i sketched one yeah and gonna... you're about to paint it yeah. someday soon yeah tonight so. actually i think it might start on yeah. it tonight but it turned out to be really cool the sketch so yeah like... it's different it's like a different yeah. approach because like with these pieces it's very chaotic and it's very you know spur of the moment so um it's sort of like you know like free jazz i guess i could look at it in a way yeah. so you know i'm just like oh blue would look good here purple would look good here what if i connect the blue with the purple with some red or like whatever i don't know um but that's you know they're very free flowing and they're very um just like fun to do almost like meditative and like um i sort of start and an abstract field and then just work my way back into making it figurative um as i go um and with this one the one that i started sketching um i actually um like put the crowd into like a, a, a scene where they're like coming out from this big like hall and um it sort of allowed me to arrange the people in the crowd in a way that i hadn't done so before so on these ones, they kind of face in all sorts of different directions and they're very chaotic and they're interacting with each other. And in this new one, um, they're sort of facing left and right in like alternating rows. Um, so mm, it kind of has a different rhythm to it and it's not as chaotic mm -hmm. and it's more organized. So it's just like a new like riff on this old idea that so I've been doing new, for a while. It's a new crowd period. Because yeah. I think you're, I think this one, the the one that you have on the bottom, part of the screen mm -hmm. um for us like the bottom right um i think that was crowd number 13 13 was it or something but it it, it had been getting quite high up there of these um like free jazz type of crowds and yeah i think maybe like 10 10 or 13 is the number of this most recent one yeah something and like that um now that you're sketching crowds i think you're in this new period of crowd drawing we're moving into yeah. a new thing mm -hmm. but there's also like you kind of touched upon it but like we've talked a lot about the philosophy of um uh individuality and even if you're from like the same religion same culture same like nationality um even if you are in a group in a crowd and you all decide okay we all are the same because of this reason or that reason there's still going to be a lot of individuality happening right um and just embracing that so um from afar it looks like a homogeneous blob but the closer you get you realize that every single person is different right and for you know a million and one reasons <laughs> and yeah i don't think you ever repeated a single character at all probably not yeah i, I don't know i haven't really yeah. looked at it i feel like i, I maybe there might be one, two numbers. yeah like that 16 year old when you were 16 you created a character that's in this one right in the bottom right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i see yeah. that one <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they're so satisfying to look at i feel like even if this was on my wall and i saw it every day I would discover something new um, each time. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Like the one, this one up here. No, it was a different one, um, but it was also predominantly blue crowd. And it was for the Everything Will Be Fine show. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we had it in the house for like a whole month before it was in the gallery. Yeah. And I did that where every single day I, I was like, wait, how did that character get there? Like that that character was yeah. not there yesterday i could swear and, yeah oh my gosh so much fun so a new um era of crowds might be coming uh or an update i'm excited to see it and i'm glad that we got to talk about these crowds um you both spoke about you know this uniqueness of people right even when you're in the sea of homogeneity um as we like abstract back out i'd love to understand you know why does highlighting these unique like characteristics of people why does that matter what keeps inspiring and motivating you towards this work well i just um it's a good question i mean i i just i just find people to be really interesting um i just think that um 
everybody has a story to tell and we can learn from each other you know um i just find that um if um people are open to other worldviews and they um you know have the chance to travel and uh, interact with different cultures and people from different walks of life um then they build empathy um and um I guess we just all use a little more empathy <laughs> these days. So um, yeah, it's just something that I'm really passionate about and something that I just think is um, super important, especially as an artist. I think, um, you know, there's so many different cultures that you take ideas from, um, whether you do it consciously or unconsciously. Um, everything that you consume, you know, all the media that you consume, all the people that you meet, um, all the conversations you have like feed into this like creative pool that you have in your brain. And I feel like it's sort of, um, I don't want to say responsibility as an artist, but it's sort of an inherent, um, like um, it's just an inherent aspect of art to want to give something back to the world. And I think um you know, spreading empathy and spreading, um, you know, the idea that everybody's an individual um, and everybody's valuable in their own way um, and everybody can build other people up um, is just a really important thing as an artist to do. Um, so that kind of started for me when uh, I went to New York City for the first time, when I was, um, I want to say 10, I think I was or nine and um you know hungary is not necessarily the most diverse place in the world um <laughs> it's a white on white <laughs> plus Basically, white. Yeah. yeah and when i went to new york for the first time and i saw like all these different people um and not just i just don't i don't just mean like skin color but i also mean in terms of fashion personality. and personality mm -hmm. yeah like people are, you know, just, they are allowed to embrace their individuality and there could be a guy walking down the street and like drag and nobody would like second guess it, for example. Um, like nobody would think twice and like stare at him. Like what is the, that weirdo doing over there? Um, they it's, would just treat it like a normal thing. Yeah, either normal or like celebrated. Or celebrated, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, there's no... That, that, you know, New York is like this utopian no, reality yeah. where there's nothing yeah. wrong. I'm right. just saying that like, as in, a in child, terms of, yeah, yeah, it's like a kid coming from, you know, like not really seeing um, many different, because my mom would always travel with me when I was a kid. So we went to like Sicily and Tunisia and Cyprus and like all sorts of places. Um, but I never saw like such a big like melting pot of people as what I saw in New York. Um, so since then, like New York has been my favorite place in the world, primarily because of that reason. Um, and I think that's where it all kind of started for me. Um, this like obsession with, um, both being part of a community and helping each other while also maintaining your individuality and being true to yourself and, um, yeah, being honest with yourself. Um, that's always been like the most important part of my art, like, you know, and I think it stems from that. Oh, I love how you described it. I think that's such an important duality to maintain that connectedness to the whole and that sense of who you are and how you uniquely contribute. Has there been a piece of, of feedback or encouragement about your work that has meant the most to you because of maybe your own like values or why you're doing it? Um, I think whenever people um, tell me that they got into making art because of me, that's always like super cool to hear. That's, that, that always means the most to me. Um, uh, and um, not just that, but when people, um, I used to do stickers for a long time mm -hmm. and I don't really do them anymore just because I'm so bogged down with projects and like paintings that I do here at home that I don't really have the time to create stickers and go out in the city, like slapping stickers on lampposts and stuff. But I remember that some of the most gratifying experiences that I've had in terms of feedback was that like on my way to high school I would put stickers on like the metro 
and then somebody would send me a photo like hey did you draw this and like they would send me like a photo of like wherever they found the sticker um because I just thought I would you know I, I would always put it on ads because I always found it super annoying that like I would be getting up in the morning um just being super tired being in a horrible mood um just having my headphones on and having to go to school where I would have to take horrible classes that I didn't care about and while I'm just you know being annoyed and angsty and moody I would just see an ad that would just piss me off because like some guy would try to sell me like dog food or toothpaste or something that like I have no you know stake in and I always felt like advertising was just being shoved down people's throats and like how much more fun it would be if you would see art in those places um, and whenever somebody would send me a sticker and they would be like, oh, like, it's so funny. It's so cool. Like it made my day and it cheered me up. Like that always, like that's, that's mm -hmm. always like the most gratifying for me. Yes. Oh, I can imagine that would be so satisfying and so cool to see what it means for another person, uh, to spark some yeah. joy randomly on their commute. Um, so this one's for both of you, you know, what have you learned along the way that's been really mean meaningful or is there any, you know, wisdom or advice that you would share with people who are trying to learn to create, to see the uniqueness in others, anything and all of that? Um, my advice for people who are trying to make this be like their job um, is like, don't let the starving artist part of history and of pop culture be romanticized because um, you will struggle at first um but don't glorify it because you'll probably just be shooting yourself in the foot mm -hmm. um just try your hardest and then as soon as you think that you can't try anymore just keep going like there, there's or like when you're having um, um an artist block because you will have them and artist blocks can be a point of complete panic because if you're having an artist block then you don't know when your next paycheck is going to be um and you don't really have that much psychological control over an artist block like right. when it comes to parts of the art world where it gets really difficult you just have to keep going through it and just wait for it to pass yeah. basically like it, it's not a barometer of if you're a good or bad artist it's just that this is going to happen to anybody um, at any age, at any point of their career. There's going to be these waves of like, oh, crap, like there's another artist block or oh, crap, like um, there is, you know, the the entire gallery didn't completely sell out and only one of the paintings sold. Yeah. Like it doesn't mean that you're good or bad. It's just there's a lot of uncertainty yeah. when it comes to selling your artwork. Right. And so I think in, in our experience, diversify your talents. Try to like, this is what we found to be best is that to only paint, to only do 3D, to only do um, clay sculptures, it's going to be much more difficult for you. So like the more that you learn different mediums of art the more mm -hmm. that you try to um be a master what is what is the phrase like um, um something master of none basically so it's like like a jack of all yeah trades. jack of all trades when it comes master to when it comes to art and um the more you can do that really the better especially with the attention deficit of pop culture these days is that yeah if you you know, if you want to be an amazing painter, um, you're probably going to struggle a lot more. So to just really try to find another talent that you can do simultaneously mm -hmm. with your other passion, like like Danny mentioned, I think twice only that the when he does, he does want to get to a point where he makes films, um, live action and animated. Uh, very far away from that still but it's like every single new art media that he learns it will benefit him to eventually yeah. eventually when he does get to that point where he he does make a film um and 
yeah, like you just literally never stop learning. Like once you're an artist and you think, okay, I have mastered this medium. I don't need to learn anymore because I can just paint and then that's it. That's that's kind of where, in in our opinion, that's where you've stopped being creative. So yeah. That's basically it. Yeah. That's sort of what I wanted to say too. So yeah. Yeah, that was so <laughs> yeah. Good. Yes, thank you. And then finally, you know, what do you want people to leave knowing about you, Nico and Danny, and about your work? And what are you looking forward to right now? Oh, well. What are we looking forward to? Um, moving to Vienna. Moving to Vienna. Next year. Big, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just looking forward to, um, like, there's a lot of projects that I can't talk about yet. Um, for like you know each one has its own reason as to why I can't talk about it but there's like a lot of stuff that I'm just really excited to have out there um and um yeah that's basically just you know we're gonna keep working we're gonna keep putting stuff out and we'll see where (laughs) where it takes us yeah it's so exciting um we'll have to stay tuned to see what the the good surprises are along the way and is there anything that you want people to leave like final takeaways about who are Danny and Nico and anything like that? Um, well, we probably sounded very focused during this <laughs> interview, but that's only because of your great questions. But um, yeah, if, if anyone is watching this and they're like, oh, wow, they really have their stuff together. Oh, they're such great planners. Like we <laughs> usually run around like chickens with our heads cut off. So is that what people are going to think we're, of? We're, we're just feel should, like such a mess up right now. No, <laughs> that's what I mean is that like usually <laughs> we're like, oh, like running around like crazy and we don't have a clear plan most of the time. So if this, if you watch this video and you think that, wow, like, they're so responsible. They know everything they're doing. They are amazing planners. It's false. It's <laughs> it's just I it was hope, a it was a very well orientated think. interview. That's why we probably <laughs> seem like we know what we're talking about. <laughs> of your methods, you're a pretty um, powerful, dynamic, amazing duo, and I feel so honored. <laughs> Um, to know you and be friends, I can't wait. If you do get back to New York, we'll all have to have a pizza, uh, yes. walk around yep. the village or something. It'll be surreal. And I hope to find you in Vienna someday too. But for now, yes. it's such a okay. privilege and I'm so excited to share your story. Thank you so much for being here. Thank all right. You. Thanks for having us.